This spring, a collective of black, indigenous, and people of color theater makers produced a letter under the banner, We See You, White American Theater. It called out a lengthy history of systemic racism in the theater, reading in part, We have watched you exploit us, shame us, diminish us, and exclude us. We see you, we have always seen you, and now you will see us. It forced institutions around the country, from Broadway to community theater, to examine everything about how they operate. Among them, the American Repertory Theater, where its artistic director, Diane Paulus, was herself called out for her own behavior. Here, she addresses this time of racial reckoning publicly for the first time. Diane Paulus, thank you so much for joining us. Very happy to be here. So I'll, I'll just get right into the heart of the matter, which is in the last few months, ever since May, there has been a reckoning of racism in the American theater. Uh, and as much as theaters may have thought they were inclusive before, there's been a demand for accountability since May. So for starters, how would you characterize what these past few months have meant for you as you looked within uh, at the American Repertory Theater? Uh, as you say, uh, Jared, I feel the, the pandemic was one major uh, disruption to, to life in the American theater. Um, but the reckoning with a long overdue legacy acknowledgement of slavery and racial injustice, uh, uh, as some have said, is... is uh, the real public health crisis in America and the cultural sector uh, is is right in the middle of it. Uh, the ART as a uh, regional theater um, is not exempt from this. And we've been reckoning with um, accountability. And I, I guess I'd want to start with maybe my personal journey in this. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, it was really when um, the country was uh, responding to the murder of George Floyd, right? And, and, and so many uh, cultural institutions and companies and uh, businesses were uh, showing solidarity as the ART did as well. There was kind of a, a moment of saying, well, what do these words really mean if you haven't looked at your own practice and, and your own uh, predominantly white, white institutions and how are you actually um, committed to the words that you're saying. Griffin Matthews was an artist uh, that I had been working with um, on a show. Uh, he was the actor in it, he was the playwright, he was the creator, the, the creative force behind it. And Griffin Matthews really put out a call of accountability for racism that he experienced as part of that journey. Well, and he, he, he directed very direct comments. He didn't name you by name, but he described you as the director of the show and of the American Repertory Theater, um, being in an environment as people who will watch his video will see where an actress was told she wasn't black enough in his, that's how he described this, uh, that he felt like his story was, was taken from him. She believes she loves black people. She buys their work, and then behind closed doors, she steals it. She manipulates it. She has no time or patience to research it. How was that to, to reconcile and live with that? Well, it definitely uh, took me into a deep inward reflection. And I think the first part of that reflection was my reaching out to him personally to, to apologize, to be accountable for my behavior and and to take responsibility for it. Um, I think the personal interaction Griff and I had, um, you know, and his graciously accepting my apology and, and our dialogue since of committing to staying in conversation about all this, but the larger issue really, I think, is how, how was it normalized? How was an atmosphere normalized um, in a rehearsal hall, in a casting process, um, in a note session, where there was an active, um, an active lens of anti-racism. If we could back up for a little bit, and if you could describe what you now understand about what that atmosphere was that you, I would assume, now understand to be racist in nature. I think one of the things that I've deeply thought about is uh, 
complicity and how, for me, actively speaking out against a comment that is made in a room is necessary, that, that we can't be bystanders, that we can't um, fall into uh, uh, a, a kind of silence. We, we now understand we're not talking about not being racist. We're actually talking about how do we become actively anti-racist. So that, that led to a personal reflection of how I can actively do that as a director. If I'm in charge of a room, if I'm in charge of uh, an, uh, the, the, the kind of atmosphere in a room, the movement that has been started by Dear White American Theater, which is a collective of Black, Indigenous, people of color, artists, and people in the theater that have called out the predominantly white-led American theater. This is theaters across the country. This is also not only regional not-for-profit theaters, but the whole ecosystem, right? Broadway, casting directors, training programs, and, and the media. Be very upfront. It's 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 directed at white media as well, of exactly. course, of which I am a part. And and we should point out that in th this all started with a letter initially signed by hundreds of artists of color who pointed out that that they feel that basically they had been used, that that their stories had been taken in some regard, that they were used in galas or they were used to be token representation when useful for institutions. Uh, and I also understand from a letter that I saw from artists of color within your own organization, and they point out that this isn't a checklist of moving forward. This is a lot of work. So how do you, how do you look at the scope of what needs to change? Yeah. Uh, the ART uh, received, as you said, a letter from our own uh, Black, Indigenous, People of Color affinity group and it was uh, a call to action, right? And I think the first question was, you know, why did it take this letter to be the call to action? But uh, upon receiving it and uh, really listening to it, um, I think the entire theater is now um, committed to really doing the work, which as you say, is not a checklist. It's a process. It's a commitment to a process. It's not work that um, we do one anti-racist training. It's absolutely the lens through which we need to look at everything. What is the suggestion about what we will see on stage? I mean, that is the interesting part of the timing of this is that theaters have this time when they can't stage anything for the most part to think about what stories they tell going forward. Uh, and to be frank, they have to balance the bottom line, stories they know audiences will inherently come to for whatever reason, whether it's a familiar story or a big name actor, uh, with telling the stories that haven't been told in this country for, you know, essentially until now in, in large measure. I think every theater, uh, I hope, is taking this moment to really consider uh, their own values. Uh, that's something we did at the ART this summer, which is really stop, look inside, have a collective process of articulating values, having discussion about it, um, getting feedback from staff, um, and, and then using your values. That's now going to determine, right, what we put on our stage, how we program, how we produce, how we choose to spend our resources. The idea that the economics go against supporting a program that celebrates values of anti-racism, that, that in itself is problematic, right? So um, I think supporting uh, the stories of uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color artists and doing it in a way that is responsible and not, right? If, if you read the Dear White American Theater Demands, it's very clear the issues of tokenization or re-trauma, right? re-traumatizing, large issues of who are you making the work for, who is in your audience. Well, it also presents a big question now, and we have been having this question for a long time, I think, or at least in recent memory, of who gets to tell what story. Does that change now? I think it's very important right now that the stories that are told 
are told and driven by the artists who have that lived experience. For us at the ART to prioritize the voices of Black Indigenous people of color, and it's not enough uh, when it's, say, just in how we cast a show, but it's in who are the lead artists, who are the playwrights, who are the directors, uh, who are the, the, the support staff. Another issue that's been on the table is leadership. And does leadership need to change after a certain time? I don't know if it's akin to, to term limits, uh, that people should step aside, white people in particular should step aside uh, to make room for more artists of color and leaders and administrators and board members and you know everybody who hasn't had a place at the table before uh, to be able to step forward and assume leadership roles. It's a sensitive question to ask you as the artistic director of the American Repertory Theater, but how do you begin to think about that? I, I think for sure uh, there should be um, change, right? There, there needs to be change. And I think, you know, it, it, it's hard when you look at uh, individuals who founded theaters, who stay at theaters for 20, 30 years, um, it's their, their creation. I think you've seen change start to happen at the leadership level. Uh, there are more uh, women leading theaters in America than there were 10 years ago. Um, there are more women of color leading theaters, but still not enough. And certainly in other executive positions in theaters, there needs to be more representation. I want to ask about a few other things. Just in the realm of theater, you were to have 1776 opening on Broadway this year. Uh, what can you tell us about the future of, of theater in this country and live performance? When do you expect that you'll be back on a stage again? It's not just um, one factor. It's your city. It's your state. It's the government regulations. For us at ART, we're part of Harvard University, so we're following the university protocols. We're also all monitoring the disease dynamics and how they're changing, right, uh, week to week. Um, so we have a roadmap to recovery and resilience for theater, which is a collaboration with the Chan School at Harvard, ART and, and the Chan School, in particular, uh, the Healthy Buildings Program. Really, the first principle is health and safety first. So you start there, and then you have to follow guiding principles, which include a willingness to be flexible, dynamic, uh, and uh, respond, responsive to the changing science. I think we're hoping that theater can be back maybe by next spring. And finally, I just want to ask, how is the theater community going to survive this? I've seen the job loss. We've seen you know, total loss of projects and, and income. What do you think is going to happen on the other side of this? I think my hope is that this disruption will allow for the possibility of transformation to be more equitable, to think about the way we do business, in uh, an anti-racist framework, that we do not go back to business as usual. And that would be very hard if we were all running 100 miles an hour to get the show on tomorrow night. I would say almost impossible, and maybe that's the, the, the poor excuse for why change hasn't happened. But there shall be no excuse, right, for this moment of this disruption and are not committing to change. That, that's how I feel. We're going through a, 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 a crisis of separation. We're not breathing together. We're not feeling our hearts beat in sync as one does at a theatrical show. Sometimes I feel like the, the theaters are practice for life of, of courage, of vulnerability, of honesty, of making mistakes. So we have to have that space to go through that because we're going to have to do that as a country and, and as, as, as human beings and, and you know, for, for all of us in the theater, for our industry. So um, I'm looking forward to that moment where we all 
jump in again because we're going to need to, right, for our survival. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly be confronting ourselves on stage as we look, in my case, from the audience anyway. Diane Paulus, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me.